for the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses, and was raised for our justification. Here ends the lesson for this evening. Grace to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Some of you may have heard this before. It's part of my faith story. When I was about 10 years old, I had been going to church for a number of years, and I suppose the message was working away on me little by little. Chink, chink, chink. <laughs> it was trying to get into me, and uh, I began to take it seriously, and I worried about salvation. And I decided that I would have to make a good effort to win salvation. And uh, this was sort of a breakthrough for me. And uh, I remember telling my mother, Mom, <laughs> I've made a decision. She says, what's that, Mark? She, I said, I'm going to try to be really good so that I can get into heaven. And she just blew me away with her next statement. There was a moment of hesitation. And she said, Mark? That's not how we get into heaven. We get into heaven by believing in Jesus Christ. He died so that we could go to heaven. Just blew me away. Here I am, 50 years later, I still remember the incident. What a novel idea. You don't go to heaven by being good. If that were the case, then Jesus wouldn't have had to have come. It's not possible. It's not possible to be good enough to stand before Almighty God in His glory. No, we are received into heaven by faith in Jesus Christ. What a novel word. Where would she get such an idea? Can she be right? Is it true? Well, the passage we just read this evening is one of those passages in Romans and Galatians and elsewhere that gives this impression. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or his descendants through the law. Understand the law. The law is what you got to obey. You got to be good. You got to do what the law says. You can't make a mistake or they'll come and get you. <laughs> not by obeying the law, but through righteousness of faith. This is an amazing thing. Um, 
I suppose the world follows after the law. Religious people in this world are busy trying to be good so they can stand before God. Isn't that what it's all about? Many religious people would say. Uh, my mother would say, no. <laughs> That's not what we read in Romans or in other places. The law brings wrath because always you break the law. And even if you're doing a pretty good job, you worry how you're doing. What if you broke it just a little bit? What if something isn't quite right? And you have to die tonight and you have to stand before God. Do you know that you have kept the law so well that you can stand before Him? You're never sure. Even the best of people are never sure. The law brings wrath. The law does not bring salvation for two reasons. One, we break it. And two, God's hands are not tied. He gives salvation to whom he wishes. And he wishes to give salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. If it were not so, he would not have sent him. For this reason, it depends on faith. For this reason, it depends on faith. In order that the promise may rest on grace and not on the law. My children have given me many occasions to uh, think about this because uh, two of our children are native born and one of them is uh, adopted into the family. Um, I suppose the first thought is that uh, how is it a child belongs to the family? Well, by blood. He's born into the family. And uh, most families have no cause to question that. Um, as the children are growing up, sometimes you have cause to question this. When a child acts up or is not obedient, many parents are tempted to say, you better be good or I'll disown you. You can go away. You can find your own place to live. That occurs to parents, I must say, as you're growing up, sometimes, as the kids are growing up. But I never wanted my children to be afraid they would be cast out. It was not because they were obedient that they were members of our household. It was something deeper. It was not because they had my blood that they were members of my household. It was something deeper. And that became apparent when we adopted our third child. And I remember the day we went to the courtroom. And the judge came in. He had been mowing his lawn. He was pulling his robes over him. And he says, this looks like a happy bunch. This must be an adoption. And he, we said, yes, it was. He says, uh, Pastor Mark, stand up and state your case. You mean there's a case to be stated? And so I... I told how we wanted this child and we wanted to take this child into our home and we wanted him to be our own and we wanted him to live with us and be our own child. And so he sort of gave us a little sermon. He said, now, as you take this child into your home, you must treat this child exactly as you do your other children. This is now your child. We sign these papers and he takes your name. He belongs to you. He didn't say this. Not by blood. Not by obedience. He hadn't done anything to earn getting into my family. He was three weeks old. But because we were promising now, we were making a covenant. And so we understood and he declared the child to be an eye guard. We signed the papers, and before you know it, we had a passport, John Luther Nygaard, son of Mark and Linda. Why was he our son? Well, there was a promise, there was a covenant standing between us now. But as he grew up, well, as he grew up, 
He heard this, you know, he heard, you are our child, you belong to us. He heard the story of the judge and how, uh, how he now was a Nygaard. But I think there came a time when he thought about it and he needed to make sure he trusted in the promise. If he were going to trust in the promise, he was going to walk in it and act like an eye guard. And if he didn't trust in the promise, then he could walk away from it. It wasn't by blood. It wasn't even by obedience. It was by believing the story he had been told, that he belonged to us and he had every right to be with us. Actually, every child... Every child faces that. But maybe adopted kids face that in a more poignant way. We Christians are adopted children. Adopted into the Jewish tribe, as it were. It depends on faith, not on obedience. It depends on God's promise, not because of anything that we have done. And though the world may look for all the world like we are not part of the people of Israel, that we are not part of God's promises, that this history is not our history, it says Abraham hoped against hope. We Christians hope against hope, against all the signs of the world, against everything that stands against us. We trust that this is true, that the rabbi that the Messiah Jesus died for us, not just for somebody else, not just for people of his own blood or his own kindred, but he died for Norwegians and UKers and Egyptians and the whole bunch of us. And so it will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead who was handed over to death for our trespasses, was raised for our justification. What will be reckoned to us? It will be reckoned to us as righteousness, our trusting in Jesus. So remember my words to my mother. Mom, I'm going to be real good so I can get into heaven. The theology of a ten-year-old. And my mother's wise reply, Mark, that's not how you get into heaven. <laughs> Blew me away. You get into heaven by your faith in Jesus Christ, by his promise that you belong to him, and then walking as if it's true. Amazing thing. It's ours because of Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection. And may your faith hold on to it and hold it fast and hold it dear so that the promise that comes with it may be yours as well. All this in Jesus' name. Amen.